Hello, I'm Mara Jones, and welcome back to Lives at Stake, a series of monthly discussions about critical issues facing transgender and gender nonconforming communities across the United States. Lives at Stake is a co-production of my project Translash and WNYC's The Green Space. Visit translash.org and thegreenspace.org to follow our work. Well, 2020 has been lots of things, and among them is the fact that it has been a record-setting year for the deaths of trans women, and the year isn't even over. So far, 28 trans women have been murdered. As my earring falls off, 28 trans women have been murdered, um, with many of those going unreported. This exceeds last year's number of 24 and continues the epic levels of violence that have reached a series of new highs since 2016. I wonder why. Um, in fact, the United States, sadly, has more murders of trans women than any other country on the planet, except for Brazil or Mexico, with nine out of 10 of those murdered Black or Latinx. That's why tonight we're going to unpack what's behind the recent spate of violence and ways that we can end it, because there are ways that we can end it. Joining the discussion tonight is Bev Tillery, who is the executive director of the Anti-Violence Project. Mariah Moore, who is the co-president of New Orleans's House of Tulip, and Lana Madison Labeja, a sex worker and survivor of violence, who will bravely be telling her story tonight for the very first time. Now, tonight's topic is going to be heavy, and we believe that that's why we want to have you involved in the conversation as a part of our community. So we need you to send in your comments and your questions throughout. You can do that in the timeline below, both on YouTube, those of you who are watching live there, as well as those who are watching live um, on Facebook. Uh, you can do so um, by using the hashtags lives at stake and or Translash on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, as I mentioned, and we will be sure to fold all of those in the program. Please make sure to do that. Now, like every single program, we're going to start tonight with a series of means and gifts that are getting us through during a week that is already beyond tough. I think that is an understatement. So first off, we're going to turn to the Emmys that were on Sunday. Of course, it was a breakthrough year at the Emmys for artists like Zendaya and shows like Schitt's Creek, but the ratings for the Emmys were down by double digits and they cut off Laverne Cox's mic. So maybe a good meme for the Emmys this year is this fire extinguisher scene between Jennifer Aniston and Jimmy Kimmel. Um, it's also the fact that we are also this, this week continuing to mourn the loss of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, the icon of social justice. But many people are also still mourning the death, continuing to, of Chadwick Boseman of Black Panther fame. And so some people took it a little too far, saying that Ruth Bader Ginsburg would be entering heaven, saying Wakanda forever. Um, I don't know about you, but it's her arms here which creep me out the most, more than anything. Um, but perhaps the meme which says everything about who she was and encapsul encapsulates her career is her slaying the devil of sexism here, totally unbothered with her crown, you know, totally in place as well. Um, she will be missed. Um, and of course, uh, during this week in which there was the judgment yesterday um, or the announcement of the charges against, uh, or the rather the lack of charges, of uh, the police involved in the death of Breonna, um, Breonna Taylor, there's of course no meme, no gifts that can make us feel better about that. Uh, before turning to the heart of our program tonight, we wanted to underscore that we will be discussing violence and graphic details tonight, um, particularly in the second segment. So we wanted to give you a warning about that up front. We'll be doing that again right before the second segment um, so that you can make any adjustments that you need and how you experience us tonight to feel safe and comfortable. We want to make sure that that happens. So on now to the heart of our program. First up tonight is Beth Hillary, who is the executive director of the Anti-Violence Project here in New York to help frame the conversation of violence for us tonight. In full disclosure, I'm a member of the board of AVP, so 
we have that disclosure. Turn the disclosure out of the way so that you can judge the conversation with that information in mind. Beth, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hey, I'm Mara. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to do this, continue to do this with one earring on. Maybe I'll start a trend. <laughs> hey, um, looks good to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're already breaking records this year. And as I said in the setup, the year isn't even over. And I'm wondering if you can tell us from where you sit, what's behind this spasm of violence this year that we are, are continuing to experience. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, you know, I'm still today reeling from the news about Breonna Taylor. And so it's hard to enter this conversation without talking about the fact that we are in, living in a society where the lives of Black women aren't valued. Um, and then adding to that, the fact that, you know, we have um, this growing um, sentiment uh, that trans people are not valued. Um, so, you know, we're seeing over and over again that, you know, the lives of trans women are not valued, particularly Black trans women um, in our society. And um, we haven't had any real strong leadership, um, really, in certainly not nationally, but even in most of our local communities, standing up to say that this, this violence is wrong, that something has to happen about it. And instead, we've seen a very uh, proactive federal government um, and leadership really trying to dismantle the rights of trans and gender nonconforming folks across the country. So all of that combined with the fact that we also have a climate of increased hate, increased hate violence in the country. Um, unfortunately, it's no wonder why um, we are seeing this increased violence and it has been increasing, as you said, year after year over the last few years. Um, um, and it's very significant. And, you know, I also just wanted to point out that of the 28 folks that you mentioned that we've lost this year, um, two of those um, have been lost to police violence as well, Amara. So um, people are experiencing and seeing violence in all aspects of their lives. Um, and that violence is becoming more severe um, and unfortunately is leading to people losing their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, with, you know, it seems like there, there are two levels of the violence. It's one on the part, as you mentioned, there's this atmosphere of violence in the society and hate crimes. Um, and then there's police violence. But then there's also this community level violence that takes place around what we seem to perceive about the value that people place or don't place on the lives of trans women. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about kind of that, all these different levels of violence and how they, they take place, particularly around this devaluing where it's so many of the murders that happen, for example, the suspects act as if they haven't done anything wrong. Right. I mean, we see so often that, you know, like you said, there are different kinds of violence and we talk about the homicides so much. Um, but I think it, it means that people are forgetting that, you know, we're talking to trans folks who are experiencing daily violence um, from, you know, the violence that they are experiencing in the street, but also violence that they are experiencing in their communities, in their homes, um, you know, and their workplaces. Combined with the state violence, and we think about state violence, we're not just thinking about police violence, but we're also thinking about all the ways that the state is devaluing and taking away the rights of trans and gender nonconforming people, denying them access to the services and the support um, that they need, education, housing, um, all of those things add up and really add to and, and piling on of violence that you know you, you can't get away from. Yeah. Um, um what do you think are some of the solutions um, to the violence that people face? I mean, I think 
Um, it's also important for us to say that besides the homicides, as you say, that we focus on, there are hundreds of survivors um, from every single incident that we hear about. We're going to hear one of those um, later tonight. Um, and um, and they also need support and help um, and can face recurring types of violence as well, not only experiencing violence one time, but in many different ways. So with all of that, I'm wondering what you think some of the solutions are that you're seeing um, both here in New York that you think are really important, either proposed or, or, it happened, or, or unfolding, um, as well as across the country. Yeah, we, we have been um, bringing together trans and gender non-income forming folks for years now and consistently people say some of the things that they need to end violence are all of those things that we all need every day to be able to live safe, secure lives. As I said before, housing, um, you know, the, the violence that people experience um, in the street in shelters when they're trying to um, to get safe, um, you know, it, it, it is uh, continuing and there aren't safe places for people to go. Um, education, jobs, access to all of those things, mental health services, and for trans and gender nonconforming folks, one of the things that we often miss is that those services and supports have to be provided in a trans affirming way. And there are very few services right now where people can go and know that they are going to be respected, again, valued and affirmed as trans and gender nonconforming people. So we have to put together policies in our cities and our states um, to make sure that there are resources given to the people that are providing those services, that those, um, that the trans and gender non-conforming led organizations are getting the resources that they need to provide services. Um, because who are people gonna go to? They're gonna go to the organizations that they trust and they know in their communities. Um, and if those organizations are not getting the resources that they need, um, then, they're not helping trans and gender non-conforming folks. Um, people repeatedly are going, seeking services and being met again with additional violence um, by providers who, even if they're well-meaning, do not understand trans and gender non-conforming folks are not meeting their needs and in some cases are um, adding to the violence and the trauma that people are experiencing daily. Um, yeah. So we're, we're pulling together policies and moving forward a policy agenda in New York City. Other folks are doing that in their communities. Um, and we've been looking at ways to create safety in community that doesn't rely on police systems and criminal legal systems that, again, um, usually end up creating more violence for our communities. Yeah, on the police front, I mean, we've seen all of these incidences this year where police are called to respond to someone in distress and then the person that they're there to help somehow ends up dying or, or murdering. So I can, I mean, I think we can understand that. And also, as you say, it's really important for us to think about the fact that violence the murders and and physical violence don't under don't only take place in isolation that all of these other things such as housing and economic support and a whole host of other things actually can help people live um, a life with less violence uh, and we, we know that to be case so be the case so we want to try to shift some of those paradigms um, one of the things that people will always say is that, okay, you've given us the things that we need to change as a society, but so often people will ask, what can I do personally? What are the things that I can, what are the ways that I can support um, or make sure that we lower violence from a personal standpoint? What do you say to those people? The, if you have a will, there's so many things that people can do. Um, first of all, make sure that you're educating yourself about the trans and gender nonconforming organizations and people in your communities. Find out what they need, what kinds of support they're looking for, um, and, and, and stand up to help provide those. 
Um, you know, in addition, I think there's so many times where we hear from people that they experience violence on the street, on the subway, as they were going to work, trying to shop in a store, and nobody said anything or did anything. And so it's an easy thing to interrupt that behavior and to stand up and say, that's not okay. Um, if you if you hear an instant where trans and gender nonconforming people are being made a joke, stop it and say, that's not okay. Um, all of that perpetuates the climate where violence is okay. And we have to change that dynamic and really say, that violence is not okay. It's not okay. It's not going to be happening on my watch. Um, so I think that there's so many ways that people can take a step every day. And if for some reason you don't know any trans or gender nonconforming folks in your community or where you live, there are lots of organizations um, that are trans led, that are supporting the trans community that you can connect with to get more information. There's really no excuse for anybody at this point. Um, and, you know, I just want to say, Amara, too, that I especially want to call on cisgender women um, because I feel as women, we need to stand up for all women. And we cannot perpetuate the conversation that trans women are not women. Um, it's on us as cis women to really just stop that. Um, and so I, I call on all cis women to really take a stand um, for your trans sisters and um, make a point of talking to people, you know, in your family who you wouldn't normally talk to about, you know, why it's important to stop violence against trans folks. You know, speak out to your local elected officials and ask them what they're doing. Um, what are they doing to stop violence against trans folks? Um, I think that every day there's something that we each can do. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really important point. Um, there are so many ways, especially for Black women, that the deaths of trans, Black trans women and the deaths of Black women overall um, mirror each other, specifically in through intimate partner violence. It's, it's, it's pretty much tracks very similarly. So as you say, you know, there, there are all these commonalities between the violence of all women, especially women of color, cis and trans. And the point that you made that there's so many things that we can do, even if you don't know a trans person, um, from standing up for trans women individually to intervening violence when you see it, to supporting organizations. Um, as you say, if you have a will, um, there's so many more things that you can do. Um, well, I thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I think that we are all like you processing and having conversations in the shadow of um, yesterday's announcement of the lack of charges involved in the death of Breonna Taylor. Um, and um, my heart goes out to you and to all of us as we continue to find a way how to hold space for ourselves and others as we grieve. Yeah, for me, I get through the grief by action. So um thanks for this and you know let's let's keep working let's keep working thank you so much for joining us um that was and is bev tillery who is the executive director of the anti-violence project you're watching lives at stake um so before we turn to our next guest i would like to just to give a reminder to everyone that during this particular conversation, we will be talking about graphic violence um, that occurred and want to give you the chance to make yourself feel safe in whatever um, you need, in a, whatever way you need to during this particular conversation. Um, if you feel the need to mute us for a little bit, you should know that this conversation will probably go for about 12 minutes or so, and then you can come back and join us for the last um, conversation if that's what you need to do. But we want to give you that heads up before moving forward. Well, right now I am so honored to have Lana Madison LaBeja join us. Lana is a sex worker and a survivor of violence. She will be telling us her story for the very first time 
tonight. We'll be hearing the details of what happened to her and why the result of her case underscores our collective responsibility in ending violence. Um, I want to say that um, we had planned um, to have Lana tonight as an anonymous guest, but just hours ago, she decided to come on camera to reveal her name um, as a sign of her bravery and her recovery and also her inspiration to other people. And so I want to um, just uh, thank Lana for that and um, bring you into the conversation. Lana, um, we're so glad to have you tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amara, and providing this platform and safety for me to share my story. It's really important. And also would like to thank Beverly from AVP. Um, they were part of you know the org that was was there for me right after and helped me through the grieving process um navigating the, the justice system that was not there so um yes thank you thank you for having me today of course thank you and i just want to remind um our audience to please send your comments and your questions using the hashtag lives at stake or um, translash across Facebook, YouTube, um, and Twitter as well. Um, so Lana, can you take us through what happened to you? What was the, the case of violence that was visited upon you personally? Okay, so um, I'm a sex worker and I was on tour here in New York City um, for the very, very first time. And um, I had gone to an out call, an out call um, to define that for people who aren't familiar with sex work lingo is when the escort or sex worker goes to the client's house or hotel room. And so he had me over at his, um, his, uh, his place where he resided and um within you know 30 minutes of hanging out and trying to you know collect my uh, my compensation for my time before you know we went into you know exchange uh the sexual services i try to get that money up front so i'm not you know scammed and so we're hanging out and um, by the third time I had, you know, asked him for, um, for my compensation and us hanging out for, you know, 30 minutes with him trying to, um, um, watching me drink this drink that I was pretending to drink. Um, he brings me to the third floor of his house where he said the, uh, money was and so we were going to go up there to get it um he had been locking behind him five deadbolted doors and i wasn't aware of it until you know i end up making my escape but um when we get to the third floor um i kind of you know i'm um i ask him you know final time i'm like hey as i'm like trying to you know be um you know, get things kind of going. Um, he comes up from behind me. I see over the peripheral of my view to my right, him swing coming around with a box cutter going for my throat. And I um, turn, you know, that's, I didn't really know um, what was really happening and not knowing, you know, this is real and this is happening to me. Um, and I uh, quickly responded by turning towards him and using my arm to grab his wrist that was going towards my throat. And I was able to, you know, um, keep him back from, from reaching it. And um, there was about a five minute like fight and uh, like wrestle of me trying to uh, escape you know that's your first instinct is you know um one try to you know um keep what he's attacking me with away from me but to also let me get the fuck out of here and where am i you know this is my first time in the city 
and um, it's just I, I'm lost, you know, and not really understanding the seriousness, you know, of like my life right here is um, being attempted to take away from me. So I um, tried to escape and, um, you know, he's, um, the door was dead bolted and that's when, you know, I realized the door was dead bolted. And so he had pulled my legs from behind and I had ended all the dead bolts, you know, were dead bolts from like behind and every room had that because the three story brownstone was all individually you know set up to where each floor could you know be locked um and so i was laying on my back and had to unlock that door and um it was five of those that that happened and he had um uh cut my throat five times by the time i had escaped and he threw me down two flights of stairs and um um yeah, I uh, survived it by a miracle. And so today, yes, this is, this is my first time sharing this publicly and talking about it. And um, I... Yeah, I think, you know, I think you, you survived it because um, you fought, I think, um, you know, we haven't gone through all the details um, yeah. and unfortunately don't have the time to, but it was it was a harrowing escape for you to leave that house while injured, while repeatedly injured, while being beaten. Oh, right. Yeah, all yeah. the way out. So, um, so and and then and, and then you had to escape the property by climbing over a fence. It was it was it, yeah. it was a lie. It was a lie. I'm wondering. Um, so you escaped people found you, um, the police came, and yes. unlike in so many cases, the police um, uh, took your case seriously and the prosecutor took your case seriously. I'm wondering um, what, um, what happened after then and how you felt about the response from, from the police. You know, I, I'm in a white body and I, I my I experienced and navigate this world with privilege and now with these institutions police you know um approach me you know um they approached me from the very get-go and beginning um you know I was very I was very nervous and on edge me being a sex worker and how you know the police were going to treat me and and respond to it but my experience was it was very positive and um it was it was also because uh, i got to see very clearly and very they, they were very transparent and upfront too um why they were why they were helping me and it's because i didn't quote unquote look like what a prostitute looks like and also what a trans person um, is supposed to look like they were just shocked and stunned, you know, when when I told them I'm a trans sex worker and he was the client and they were just like, you know, very you know, they, they t were telling me this, you know, and just like it was like just unbelievable, you know, after I just got out of that, you know, they're showing their assholes, you know, and um, um, but yes, I they were really, you know, supportive to me because because of that. And um, um, the DA, the DA, when they picked it up as well, that was, you know, um, also a, um, you know, they they were, you know, prosecuting on my behalf, trying to get this guy, you know, locked up. And um, unfortunately, the grand jury just like, I think it was, it's when they acquit. Um, I think the same, I think that was what today for Breonna Taylor, it was the grand jury that had acquitted the men. And so I think it was similar kind of case where the grand jury determined to not move forward with the charges. Um, and uh, 
and, and we were all very confident the DA's office, um, you know, everyone kept assuring me that this is a ballpark case. And so it was just very startling when um, I got the phone call a week later after the grand jury that the charges, you know, were, were dropped and he was acquitted. So, um, and, and that was because of the institutions like the DA's office or the police. Sure, they could have done better jobs in terms of evident like presenting their evidence and fighting for you know um and, and you know they they could have fought in a different manner and whatnot but i think you know i there's a saying apparently within you know law culture about it's you know it's really easy to to get an indictment and anyone can get an indictment just so it was very you know for him to not get an indictment was really um um telling in terms of you know of uh the prejudice of a jury and a bias um when you are when they when they um are you know um dealing with trans people sex workers people of color and not you know seeing serving the best interests of the victims and in the case of of me you know and so um yes i i've had to live with you know um you know this having survived a really traumatic uh thing and and live with that ptsd and live with the fears and um you know and, and always have to have these flashbacks but also live you know knowing you know a, a grand jury in brooklyn new york didn't see my humanity, and um, I, I, it, I don't know what's worse to have to, you know, live with because one is, you know, my future, and and I, you know, as a survivor, if this was to ever happened to me again, I would do everything in my power to avoid going through that justice system, and and you know, and and that's also something going forward in my life. What does justice look like? and having to put a new goggles new lens on my face and and reframe you know kind of what i had always thought and what justice was you know um taught to me and um reframe it and really you know see it in a different light of you know how do i find justice for something like this and you know um yeah that's been you know in terms of navigating um the world and healing and with my road to recovery um from yeah. this act of violence it's it's been that you know and asking those questions yeah i think it's really important all of the things that you have taken us through particularly the impact of the violence on your life because i think that one of the things that gets so lost in these conversations about violence and about death of trans women is the understanding that, as you said, that uh, trans people, trans women are human beings. And consequently, um, telling people tonight how it's impacted your life has been really consequential. And also this piece that you just shared about um, the damage that not receiving justice through the justice system has had and how it make you skeptical in reporting anything that might happen in the future, um, which um, is also, I think, uh, a reality. Um, one of the things I, I think I, I just wanted to highlight for people, because I think it's really important, is that, you know, essentially the only thing that you were asked by the grand jury or to explain to the grand jury is whether or not you were a sex worker or not and what that meant. And so that seemed to be a big way that they judged whether or not they were gonna hold this person who had kidnapped you and had tried to kill you um, to account. That seemed to be, and I'm just wondering if you can just tell us that experience when you went in and they just asked you, I think one, yeah. one or two questions. So, uh, you know, when I, uh, we spent about six hours that day with the DA trying to prepare me and, you know, get what he was gonna, you know, ask me before, you know, we spent six hours of him re-traumatizing me pretty much. And by the time I got before 
a grand jury. I don't know if he, he just didn't want to continue because I was too shaken up, but he asked me like three or four questions, which was, what was my name? Um, what do you know? Was, and what do I do for a living? And I tell him I'm a sex worker. And then he asked, what is a sex worker? Define that to the grand jury. So I define, you know, I, I sell sex for money. And, um, and, and then the, the next question was, oh, what happened to you? And this was right after the assault, you know, about six weeks after. So I still had, you know, knife slashes on my throat. So I just unwrap my scarf and show the grand jury. And I'm like, do I need to go any further? Well, then the next day, the grand jury, the, the assailant shows up to the grand jury and gets to tell his whole side of BS, whichever that was. And I, you know, this is all undisclosed. Everything is, you know, private and kept private. So I don't know what he says. And I don't know how many minutes he's before grand jury to persuade them with whatever, you know, and, um, but I mean, I do know what he said, because, uh, but this was all off the record, but the DA and the cops had already prepared me, you know, under the table of kind of being like, just so you know, and you're not thrown off, but like, he's going to be claiming you're, you know, a hooker was trying to rob him. Like, you know, and I'm, you know, well, how did I end up in the third floor? But, you know, with trails of my blood down, you know, stairs. So it's just like, and, and that's what, you know, was um, supposed to like, um, like that should have easily just been rebutted. And, and um, I, I it, yes, um, the grand jury or the DA's office failed in the sense of, I wasn't able to, you know, they weren't, fighting with all the evidence of being, you know, like, I, I, I just don't know how the, it wasn't clear to a grand jury. And, um, um, but also it was how the assailant went and spoke usually what I've been told from like AVP lawyers were that the assailant never goes before the grand jury. Their lawyer usually will keep them, but this guy is a, a, a sociopathic, you know, serial attacker. And um, I'm glad I'm here today because, you know, I can share and I've lived his story, but I am so afraid he's going to strike again. And he made some, you know, very, you know, um, insinuating comments about how he's tried to see other girls. Also an escort agency um, had him blacklisted for getting very violent with their with their um, providers. And so, you know, it's like he's a he the, it, he's a cold blooded killer. And the cops had told me that when they interviewed him, they pulled me outside and were like, sweetheart, my six years as a detective in Greenpoint, I've never met a psychopath. And just by interviewing him, it was like a cold blooded killer I was interviewing. And that was just chilling down my you, down my spine as I'm telling that but in that moment I was thinking of you know I never wanted to ever see one person could be responsible for something this sadistic to me I always saw everything as you know there's something much larger that is why he did it I was thinking I was gonna get I was a victim of someone trying to traffic me but or you know it, it didn't make sense and the cops were just telling me no sweetheart sometimes it's just as simple there's sick evil people out there and you were you're a trans sex worker and they were targeting you for that reason and yeah well i wanted to just um thank you for telling your story um for trusting us trusting me to come on and to share your story Tonight, um, it was harrowing. I know that I speak for everyone that we are glad that you survived. While you were speaking, you received some audience comments who, uh, from people like Jeslyn who said to just tell you that, um, that they thank you for coming forward and that they're sending you a lot of love. So there are a lot of strangers that you um, don't know who are sending you love tonight. And I know that one of the reasons why you wanted to come forward was that you wanted to let people know that this person was still here and free in Brooklyn um, and you wanted to warn about the what's possible, um, what's what's out yeah. there, so. I live in Brooklyn and I, I live here now, so I, I'm not gonna run from my trauma and I'm here, you know, to face 
you know, head on and, and, you know, honestly be as close as I can, you know, um, to the place that is the most terrifying and reclaim my power. And the moment I moved here, it was, you know, I, I, the first day it was like your power never left you, you know, and it's always here. And so if I could tell anyone listening, it's, you know, um, yes, we, we all have power in us. And so thank you for, for giving me this platform. Thank you so much. And thank you for leaving us with um, that extremely powerful message about the fact that we all have power. I know that I speak for everyone where we wish you all the best in your recovery and dealing with your trauma and um, in reclaiming your power even more. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Bye. Bye. Uh, that is Lana Madison Lebeja, who is a sex worker and a survivor of violence, who told us her story for the very first time tonight. You're watching Lies at Stake. Um, well, next up, um, we will be speaking to uh, the one, the only Mariah Moore, who is co-president of the House of Tulip, an organization in New Orleans, which takes a comprehensive approach to dealing with violence from economic to housing insecurity to health insecurity. Um, as I have written about before, we have to take that approach in order to be able to deal with violence. It's not only the specific incidences, but the, um, the environment surrounding violence. We're also thrilled to be talking to Mariah because uh, she was just named to the Route 100 as one of the most influential African-Americans. So for so many reasons, uh, Mariah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Amara. Thank you, thank you. So the House of Tulip is really, um, you know, a microcosm of so many positive things and approaches to deal with violence, as I mentioned, from housing, housing insecurity to health insecurity to economic insecurity and so many other services that you all are um, connecting people with. And um, I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about why you started House of Tulip um, with your uh, co-president, Milan. Yeah, so thank you so much again for that uh, beautiful introduction. So myself and Milan Cherry, who is uh, also uh, one of the co-founders and co-directors of the House of Tulip alongside myself, came together um, to fulfill a need that we saw, um, a continuous need that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic that we always knew existed. Uh, but more personally for me, I think I was so invested because of my many life experiences, right? I am a former sex worker. Uh, I am a survivor of anti-trans violence. Uh, while engaging in sex work, I have faced housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, amongst a plethora of other uh, obstacles and barriers in my life. Uh, and so it was so important when I came together with other community leaders here in New Orleans and we participated in our COVID crisis relief fund which provided about $20,000 that was redistributed directly to community in response to the need uh, caused by the, the pandemic. Um, and my, me and myself, m myself and Milan came together after that we concluded the COVID crisis fund to really think about ways in which we could provide long-term solutions for our community. And the thing that we landed on was housing because we know that housing is, is the first step to addressing all of the other issues. Uh, the issue areas like employment, linkage to care. Um, um, yeah, so just really thinking about, like we talked about yesterday, really having a big solution for a big problem, um, you know, bringing community together and really creating a network of sisterhood and siblinghood uh, that many of us don't have. Uh, and, and, and many of us will, you know, experience a lot of the things that we're addressing. So that was my main reason for um, coming together with Milan to create the House of Tulip. And I'm sorry, today has been a really rough, really rough day. Um, there's been a lot going on. So if I stumble a little bit, please excuse me. No, it's, it, is, it is a very rough day. Um, it is a very rough day. Um, on this particular point, I think one of the things that's innovative about 
the hustle tulip is the fact that you actually put the goal of, of building assets and um, ownership for trans women. You have a model of building a, a desire to build this community um, where you're raising money to build homes for uh, trans women that you will eventually help trans women uh, put down payments on properties that you're trying to create an ownership model. And I think that the reason why that's important people may not realize is that we know that, for example, if you make them, if you make less than $24,000 a year, um, uh, you are three times more likely as a woman to be susceptible to violence than if you make $75,000 a year. So in so many ways, violence is an economics issue. And that's one of the things that you are um, approaching and attacking. And I'm wondering what you're finding the response to that is um, when you say, look, we're raising money to make sure that trans women can have assets. Yes, absolutely. So not just trans women, the entire TGNC community, right? So yes. with, a, with, a, with a razor sharp lens on the most marginalized, which include black trans women and femmes, undocumented folks, folks with disabilities. But the response has been um, over an overwhelming outpour of support. I think that a lot of people really have been waiting on something like this that really addresses not just one issue area, but every issue area, right? Fully and true wraparound services, but also having a plan of growth and like you said assets not just saying this is a shelter and it ends here because it doesn't end here we want to we want to walk through your walk through life with you grow with you and then see you off so that you can see someone else through this process right it's an inheritance and so when we talk about building that inheritance that includes the first step of our our, our housing structure which is immediate housing which does it's zero barrier right so you know there are no term limits or time limits to when you can stay um and we will work with you to determine what the next steps should be the second phase of our project is actually obtaining small plots of land right and building upon that right never selling the land but granting the but like you said granting that uh to our community members where they can own the actual structure right so that community land trust, it always stays within community. So I think this is something that we've never seen before, something that's inspiring, something that people, a lot of our community members are excited about because they're finally getting a chance at life when you think about it, right? For many of the founders that are involved with the House of Tulip, this is the, this is the closest that we've ever been to the home ownership process. That speaks volumes. You know, and, and I think it's just so powerful that, you know, even this process inspires us to to want more, to do more for ourselves, let alone other people, because it's showing us what we truly deserve. And that is so critical. Yeah. And I mean, as you say, like the basis for housing really is the basis for everything else, right? It's the basis to get a job. It's the basis to access everything else. Like we've built a society where housing and home ownership really becomes the basis for so many things. And the exclusion of trans women from that process is actually is one of the contributing factors to um, our deaths, right? Um, that that's a reality. Um, what are the, some of the ways that people can well, let me, before I ask that question, what are the things that you're learning about this process of, and this different approach to ending violence, this more comprehensive approach that you hope will be replicated across the country? You're in New Orleans now, but if you were giving, you know, um, if there thing, what are the things that you're learning that you hope other people copy, essentially? I just hope they copy the zero barrier uh sentiment that we're we're carrying with us like yes things will be tough things will be difficult to navigate but we're not going to give up on community because we don't want community to give up on us right we're going to figure out ways to work with community members but also realize that one specific approach does not apply to each individual community member so moving forward knowing that you have to have an individualized plan for each person that comes into your care right you have to you know make sure that they are getting gen uh, genuine gender affirming care right not just in healthcare, but in housing 
making sure that they feel comfortable accessing that education that you are providing because ultimately that is your responsibility so really taking on the challenge to really commit to walking community to to really being there and walking with community members each step of the way guiding them each step of the way right when and realizing and giving grace that people may fall behind a little bit right we have to be willing to give that grace and allow them to start over because many of us have started over several times in many different situations. So I, it is just my hope that people will really take zero and housing first approaches and realize that just because you give housing doesn't mean that you can't uh, venture off into other things. Realize that housing is the basis of addressing all of these issues. I know firsthand, right? I know that you know when I didn't have stable housing, a safe space, a safe space to sleep. I wasn't looking for a job. I wasn't trying to get an education. I wasn't trying to see a primary care physician, right? I wasn't worried about the things that I was consuming like food uh, and even alcohol. I wasn't worried about that because I was in pure survival mode. I didn't have a support system, right? I didn't have people speaking life into me in some of those moments. So that's so critical for us to create uh, these homes, right? these beloved homes, these communities, these networks of love and support. So yeah. that's what I want people across the country, across the world to move forward with, right? Yeah. So don't think of it as a program, think of it as an inheritance, as a home, as a beloved home, you know, treat it as if it was your own personal space, right? And how you like things. Yeah. That's how we're moving at the House of Tulip. Great. And um, I just want to let you know that I, some uh, people in our audience are agreeing with you that it is a rough week. I just wanted to let you know that you are not um, alone in that. Uh, one person said, yes, rough week, rough, rough year, that they um, feel you on that. So there are lots of people um, who are sharing uh, the same sentiment. Um, Jacinda Morrison is her name. So just so that you know that. Um, I wanted to... Um, Ask you lastly, what are the ways that people can support the House of Tulip? People can support the House of Tulip by sharing our website, uh, making a donation if you can, sending resources our way. If you know of some sort of opportunity, of some sort of partnership, educational resources that we could use uh, to further educate ourselves as you know leaders uh, in this movement and in this fight, please send it our way. If you have donations and you're in the New Orleans or the Louisiana area, send them our way. Reach out to us. If you want to, you know, uh, have a, a future in volunteering with the House of Tulip, reach out to us. All contributions aren't monetary, and you know, right. sometimes your time is 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 the greatest gift that you can give. And so, just reach out. You know, even if you're not in, in in Louisiana or in New Orleans, and you have a skill or a gift or a talent that you want to share, we can do it virtually. Reach out. Especially, we need to see good representation. We we, we need to see representation representation of trans folks living and thriving and speaking life back into one another. So, if you are a trans or gender non-conforming person who has, you know, has a uh, some sort of um, you play an instrument or you're a storyteller, something that you want to contribute um, to the community, please reach out to us. There's more than one way to get involved. Great. Well, Mariah, thank you so much. I think we can end this interview by um, a, an audience comment, also from Jacinda Morrison, who said that what you're doing is wonderful. So um, I think that that is the way that we all feel. Thank you so much um, for joining us uh, during what is, as you say, a very, very, very tough day. Mm -hmm. um, you are watching Lives at Stake. That brings us to the end of our program um, for tonight. Um, we wanted to um, make sure that we spotlighted um, and highlighted the issues of violence and the ways in which they're unfamed during this unprecedented year so far, but also ways that you can, and we can all address violence 
And we have so many solutions tonight from Bev's advice of ways that we can take action, action personally, regardless of whether we know someone who's trans or not, to um, comprehensive ways that we can rethink the safety and security of trans women to the work of nonprofits from House of Tulip. We really hope that tonight's uh, lives at stake on this issue has been really educational and hopefully positive because at the end of the day, it doesn't have to be this way and we can end the violence um, that is taking place against trans women and against all women. Um, and we want to make sure that you leave with that hope tonight. Uh, this is Amara Jones. Um, you are watching Lives at Stake. Um, we will actually put in the um, in our in our chat what our next Lives at Stake is. It will be at the end of November. We hope that all of you can join us. Have a good night um, and be safe.